My brothers and sisters, I think it's quite obvious that our readings in Psalms and Gospel today are all about love. Jesus tells us in today's Gospel that to love God with our whole heart, mind, and soul, and to love our neighbor as ourself are the first and greatest commandment of all. Now, as I began praying and listening to this message and preparing for this homily, the first thing that struck me was all the ways that I have failed miserably trying to live out this first and greatest commandment to love. Well, that certainly wasn't very uplifting for me, to say the least. But then, the Holy Spirit brought to my mind how the Apostle John, in his first letter to the church, declares that love consists in this. Not that we have loved God, but that God first loves us. Aha, God loves first. God must love first. God always loves first. Now that teaching, that truth is so essential to the reality of love that I believe it would be downright impossible for any of us to love God, anyone else, or even ourselves for that matter, unless we had first experienced God's incredible love for us. Sisters and brothers, before you or I can truly love anyone, we need to hear in the depths of our own heart, in the depths of our being, God say to us, I love you, you. Think about it. Even Jesus, before he began his public ministry of love and compassion, needed to hear his father say to him, you are my beloved and I am pleased with you. You see, that's what gave Jesus the courage and the strength to endure insults, betrayals, and every kind of indignity, and to suffer literally the loss of everything. And yet, to do it without bitterness or resentment, or without seeking revenge. In essence, for Jesus to do it in love, for Jesus to do it with love, for Jesus to do it for love. Now that same realization of how deeply God loves me has certainly transformed some very challenging and difficult times in my life. Events that could have easily turned me into a bitter and resentful old buzzard. <laughs> and we've all seen a few of those around, haven't we? We might have even seen it in our own selves at times. You know, ever since the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night back in 1974, and spoke into the depths of my heart and said that if I were the only person that ever lived, he would have done it all just for me because he loves me. Ever since that night, I've been totally convinced of God's unrelenting love for me. And that realization, that deep conviction is the one truth that has never failed, not just to sustain me, 
but to literally transform many of those potentially embittering and disheartening circumstances of my life. Transform them into wonderful, life-giving, and uplifting experiences that bring tears of gratitude and joy to my heart instead of bitterness. All those encounters that could have easily resulted in me being bitter, resentful, and feeling like a poor victim were transformed by the love of God into the most incredible treasures that I could have ever imagined being blessed with. So how does that work, actually? Well, I'd like to share with you a very personal example. Back in 2014, I had quadruple bypass surgery, and as I was waking up, my wife, Christy, was sitting there at my side. And she, she informed me, because I was really groggy, she informed me that I had been kept in an induced coma for five days after the surgery because the surgeon couldn't get my heart to resume normal function at first. And as I laid there, after Christy left, I laid there in the recovery room at St. Luke's, I started asking the Lord, well, why did I have to endure being in a coma for five days? I mean, after all, literally hundreds of people had been praying for me. I even knew that some people were, were on pilgrimage in Rome and they had prayed for me and offered mass at St. Peter's. So why couldn't you have just healed me a little faster, Lord? <laughs> then just a few hours later, the nurses and the aides wheeled a new bed into the recovery room and placed it kitty-cornered to me just in the perfect position so I could see this man's face on the other side of the room. And I was struck by the terrible suffering on this man's face. He must have been in terrible suffering. At least it seemed so as I looked at his face. I mean, this guy had so many machines and drugs and tubes coming in and out of his body that I could hardly believe it. And then this loving voice deep inside whispered to me and said, Jim, do you have any idea how precious he is to me? Do you have any idea? And I said, yes, Lord. I know because I'm precious to you too. And if I'm precious, everybody's precious. At that point, there was an instant connection between me and this man, a communion between him and me. We were one. And I started praying for him. I prayed things like, Lord, I know you can do anything. You can reach through all those tubes and all that medication. And you can reach deep into this man's heart. And you can reveal yourself to him and you can show him how much you love him, how precious he is to you. I know you can do that, Lord. You did it for me. Do it for him. And because the, med, the med medications that I had been on for all those days uh, were still coursing through my veins, I, I couldn't sleep all that night. And so I spent the night, rather than feeling sorry for myself, I spent that entire night praying for this man and watching his face. And even having a sense of incredible joy over our connection. And the trust that flowed out of God's great love 
for both of us, we were connected. And then the next morning, Christy came in to see me. I couldn't wait to tell her what had happened that night. It was wonderful. I had a wonderful night. And then she told me, Jim, you're not going to believe this. That man's name is Joseph. And he's the brother of a friend of ours, Rita Gonzalez. We had known Rita for several years and a wonderful woman, full of the spirit. And he was her brother. And then after Christy left, Rita came in to see her brother. And after she visited her brother for a while, she came over and stopped to visit me because Christy had told her that I was there too. And I'll never forget the tears streaming down Rita's face as I told her what God's message was to me about her brother Joseph about how precious he was to God. She was so grateful to hear at this time of great concern for her brother Joseph that how precious he was to God and that God had decided to reveal that so that she could know this too and her entire family. You know, Joseph died in hospice a couple weeks after that but the bond of love, that oneness, that communion between him and me, well, it's still as strong as ever to this very day. Every now and then when I need to, I feel his presence. Joseph comes and comforts me. Because love can never die. Love is forever, not even death can take it away. The saints and mystics down through the ages have all been convinced of this. Just listen to what our brother and teacher, Pope Francis, has to say about love. We have a treasure of life and love which cannot deceive and a message which cannot mislead or disappoint. <clears throat> it penetrates to the depths of our hearts, sustaining and raising us up. It is a truth which is never out of date because it reaches that part of us which nothing else can reach. Our infinite sadness can only be cured by an infinite love. My sisters and brothers, the most incredible thing about that encounter with Joseph at St. Luke's that day is this. That difficult event, which could have easily resulted in my lying there being bitter, <clears throat> resentful and feeling like a victim was transformed by the love of God into the most incredible treasure that I could ever imagine being blessed with. And I can truthfully say that if another Joseph or a Josephine for that matter needed someone to be there for him or her in that same way needed me to be there for him in that same way. I would do it all again gladly, and I'd do it with joy because of the love of God. When you know how precious you are to the Lord, you'll do it too. Just like the Thessalonians in today's reading, you and I will become imitators of the Lord receiving the word in times of great affliction and yet with great joy from the Holy Spirit. And when we do that, 
you and I can then be models, models for all believers.